Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, family. Welcome, welcome, welcome to The Mental House with me, your host, Khadija. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to get with you guys the last couple of days. I was trying to secure an interview with um, Tina Spivey. Um, and I was not able to because, you know, just talking about this sometimes just brings up old memories that that are just too disgusting to deal with. And I want to say that this city has never recovered from this situation and this incident that took place on July. Basically, the mayhem ended on July 22nd, 1991. The world found out about it on July 23rd. Okay? And, um... Before I go into anything, I just want to pay homage to a few people here. And that is Stephen Hicks, 19, who was got drunk and then hit in the head with a barbell and strangled. And then his body was dismembered with a carving knife. He later pulverized the bones with a sledgehammer and scared, scattered the bones across the property. Stephen Tume. He got drunk and then smashed in the chest um, and then was placed into an overstuffed suitcase. He was crushed into it and drug out where he was cut up into little pieces in his, and put into plastic bags. Then you had uh, James Doxeter. He was 14. He was drugged and then strangled. His flesh was removed from the bones with acid. And again, the bones were pulverized. Then you had Richard Guerrero. He gave, um, he was uh, dismembered and the corpse disposed of in the garbage can. Anthony Sears was 26. I'm sorry, Richard Guerrero was 23. Anthony Sears, 26, strangled him before dismembering the corpse, cut off his head and genitals to keep his trophies. He then painted a skull. Raymond Lamont Smith, 33. Strangled the victim and engaged in oral sex with the cadaver. He then dismembered the body and removed the head. The skull was then painted gray and placed in his refrigerator. The bones were left in a tank of acid until all the bones were defleshed. He then placed the bones around his apartment as ornaments. Edward Smith, 27. He was killed at 213 Oxford in in Oxford apartment at on North 25th Street. He was enticed where he was drugged, strangled, and dismembered. Ernest Miller, 22. He too died at the Oxford Apartments, which we like to call the Nightmare on 25th Street. He was lured lured into the apartment with a promise of $50 to take some pictures. He was then drugged and had his throat cut and Dom, the guy removed the flesh with acid, bleached the skeleton and kept it in, in his wardrobe. He also kept the victim's biceps, placed them in the freezer, freezer for later consumption. David Thomas, 23, he also deceased at the Oxford Apartments. He had a lace drink and it was dismembered. Curtis Strauder, 19, was drugged and strangled. His cadaver was dismembered and the bones crushed. The skull was kept and the rest was dumped into the garbage. Earl Lindsay. Earl Lindsay. Um, I was familiar with his sister 
Rita Isabel. And um, he was a baby. He was 19. He was strangled. Darwin had all sex with the corpse before dismembering it. He kept the skull as a trophy. Anthony Hughes was 31, who I was very familiar with. He was a mute, deaf mute. He did sign, of course. He was also a person that was a friend. He considered himself a friend. He was drugged and strangled. He left the body around the apartment for a couple days before the process of dismemberment was engaged. The corpse was left dissolving in acid and his skull was kept. Then we had little Conorak Simpson Phone, who was only 14, little Laotian. He had a hole drilled into his head in the back of his cranium and he was injected with hydrochloric acid into the frontal lobes of the brain while he was still alive. The body was dismembered and stored in acid. Then we had Matt Turner who was 20 years old. He was drugged and strangled. The body dismembered, left lying around. The cadaver was in the apartment, split open in a tub. Jeremiah Weinberger was 23. He had in boiling water injected into his head and left alive in a comatose state for two days. He was later strangled and his dismembered and his body was, was stored in acid. Oliver Lacey He was drugged and strangled. He sodomized the corpse before storing it. His heart was kept in the fridge. Joseph Bradahoff. Joseph was lured in the apartment by being offered money. He was then drugged and strangled. The corpse was again dismembered, but not completely. The head and torso were kept in the apartment. Two victims that got away. You had Keyshawn Synthesis Phone, who was 13 and the brother of Conorak. Just 24 hours after moving into his new apartment on North 24th Street, this demon was in trouble with the police. He had conned the Laotian boy Keyshawn Synthesis Phone into coming up to his apartment. Once there, Dahmer drugged and molested him, but the boy escaped. He reported the incident to police and Dahmer was charged with sexual assault and enticing a child for immoral purposes. He spent one week in jail before being released on bail. On January 1990, he was found guilty, but sentences wouldn't take place for another four months. And the luckiest person of all was Tracy Edwards. Tracy was tempted into 213 by Dahmer where he was given a cocktail to make him drowsy. He then tried to make sexual advances toward Tracy and Tracy started to struggle when handcuffs were slipped into his right arm. As he went for a knife, Tracy made a run for the unlocked door. And he tried to, and then his perpetrator tried to haul him back inside when the brawl started, and he was hit hard on the side of the head, knocking him to the floor. Tracy had escaped and ran into the street where he flagged down a patrol car, and the cops were led to this chamber of horrors that the cops would linger in their minds for the rest of their lives. There were photos in various stages of dismemberment, a severed head lying on the floor. The fridge had three bags containing a heart, flesh, and a portion of a muscle. The freezer contained three heads, a human torso, 
a bag containing flesh and some internal organs. The cover contained various chemicals and two uh, bleach skulls. On the floor, there was a large kettle holding two hands, a penis, and some testicles. And there were three more skulls found in the filing cabinet. A wardrobe contained a complete skeleton, dried human scalp, and more genitals. In a box, there were two more skulls. And next to that box, there was a 260-liter vet containing acid, where police found three human torsos in various stages of decomposition. If y'all don't know by now, that's what Jeffrey Dahmer did in the city of Milwaukee. And again, this city has not been the same since. We have not recovered. We actually have not recovered from the racism, the sexism, the just the overall disrespect of the black and brown community. How Jeff was allowed to maneuver back and forth, up and down, which was just amazing to me because if a white black person moves into an all white neighborhood in an all white community, he is going to be under so much scrutiny. A lot of times they just leave. But no, this man was able to move over on 25th Street 20, and just wreak havoc. Just wreak havoc. Apartment 213 was a horror chamber. As a health inspector, I used to go around the area over there and you always smell this foul smell and anybody knows what dead rats smell like. And because my job was at was a self-initiated position, like cops, you, if you're not, it's, it's caller driven. So if you don't get a call, you don't initiate. But I always wonder why that apartment smells so bad. So when we finally found out, you can imagine. The racism that was involved in that in that situation, like giving Conorak sent the some phone back to Jeffrey after everybody in the neighborhood told those two white officers, Bartra Zach and was it Bartlett? No, I don't know what his partner name, but I remember Bartra Zach because now he's head of the police union. The guys were fired by Chief Ariola, who tried to do the right thing, and he was later sent to Seattle. He was sent, gave his um, bags and sent packing. I believe he was a Venezuelan or a Filipino, but he was very sensitive to the situation. And of course, white people couldn't have that. That was something that was unacceptable. So he ended up being shipped out. The job the police end up getting their jobs back. And we continue to feel raped and robbed, disenfranchised, and just basically marginalized. There was two officers that actually were in the apartment that actually found the skeleton. One name was Robert Rolf and, and the other name was Rolf Miller. These two guys end up getting disability because they couldn't get the, my, um, the, the sights out of their minds. What they had engulfed, encompassed that day. They were able to collect disability and leave the department. I think it was one of them. Robert said that... Uh, he heard a woman screaming. That's all he could remember. Except the woman, the voice of that woman was coming from him. 
and it, the macabre that he experienced that day, he can never get it out of his mind. Especially the refrigerator scene. However, the sad part about that was that the stenographer who tried to get disability because she had to sit there and type all that evil and macabre and mayhem and she was not granted disability. She ended up quitting. She ended up losing them a lot. Last I checked. And the racism... Tina Spivey was a young lady who tried to call, the, uh, told the police initially that there was a little boy out there, and the police said, we'll send somebody there. And they were actually fighting Jeffrey Dahmer, trying to keep the little uh, guy away from Jeff, Jeff trying to get him back to the apartment. When the police came, these young ladies, Tina and her cousin had protected him quite well. And that's why, you know, it was kind of disappointing that I couldn't get her on the, on the program, but living, reliving that is kind of difficult. And we had a real good conversation the last time I was at Wendy's. And it was a few years ago, and she was saying how her life would never, ever, ever be the same. Ever. And that all she does is think about that over and over and over again. And most of us who lost a, a loved one or a friend during that time, just the mention of that sends chills down our spine. That Jeff was allowed to lay in the back community and just eat us, eat black men, and that we were in such a destitute situation that a white man could come in and offer you money and offer you pictures and because nobody's hardly working or in a position where they can't take an extra 50 or 100 dollars they were lured into this satanic hell hole with that with the devil himself That was 26 years ago. It seemed like it was just yesterday. And again, I mean it when I say the city hasn't recovered from that. Ain't recovered yet. So, I just thought I'd pay homage to those guys today on this morbid anniversary. Because they're not, they're, not, they're gone, but they're not forgotten. And may God bless them families. Alright y'all. If y'all like what you hear. Please like, subscribe, and share. See you next time in the mental house. Bye bye.